Hello, welcome to PM Express Personality Profile. Tonight, my guest is a medical doctor born in the northern part of the country, graduated from medical school as far back as 1972. But what many of you know him for, possibly, uh, might be the fact that he has been very consistent in our political landscape. He, stook, he stood for president in 1976. He stood for president again in 2000, 2004 and 2008 on the ticket of the People's National Convention, PNC. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about by now. My guest on PM Express personality profile is Dr. Edward Mahawa. It's great to be in your home, sir. The pleasure is mine, and thank you for coming. We haven't heard from you a lot uh, during the 2008 elections, uh, up to up to, sorry, 2012 elections, up to up to today, we're in February. What went wrong? I mean, did you just decide to focus on your practice as a doctor? Yes, uh, nothing went wrong, but uh, the People's National Convention decided to try uh, with another gentleman for the candidature. Mm. And um, I made a deliberate in, uh, effort to, to let him be known to the Ghanaian public and uh, not confuse them. So basically, I took myself out of politics just so that he could go. Mm. And um, that's why you haven't heard from me politically. That's but fine. I'm still doing my work as a doctor. Great. So, I mean, many people do not know you uh, intimately as a medical doctor. But you've been around since 1972. Uh, tell us what first shaped your decision to be a medical doctor and then uh, what made you juggle that with yeah. active politics? Yes. Um, well... You know, I grew up in Nalergo, and when I was growing up in Nalergo, there was not even a hospital there. But during the period that I entered primary school, the American Baptist Mission decided to open a medical hospital there. And the doctor who came, the American doctor, actually started his clinic under a tree in a mobile van. During that time, um, I met him at the lorry park of the village, trying to communicate with one of my countrymen. He didn't speak Mampule, the guy didn't speak English, so I interpreted for him. He was so impressed, he invited me to come. He was living in Tamale and driving 105 miles to Nalergo to, to provide medical care, so he invited me to come and help him interpret. And that is how come I got to know of orthodox medicine, because up until that time, there was no hospital, no clinic, so we were using herbs and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. But once I got to uh, know him, I thought that the job he did was cool. But I was motivated to become a doctor because at that same time, a schoolmate of mine, in fact, a classmate of mine, had his mother develop what we call the psycho-vaginal fistula women who go into labor and the labor becomes obstructed, they labor for many hours, they end up destroying the base of their urinary bladder. So they can't control the urine. The, the, everywhere they go, the urine is dripping as it is formed by the kidneys. And she became an outcast in her own house. Nobody wanted to associate with this woman. And I felt at that time that, why is it that doctors can't help this woman? So I decided that I'll be a doctor that will help people who are in labor, mm -hmm. and that is how I became a gynecologist. I see. So, so the motivation to become a doctor was not um, necessarily because you, you saw an avenue to become a rich man when you grow. Indeed. That was not At the, the time, I didn't even know what doctors made, what, what, what kind of income they made. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time I was growing, if you were a teacher, you were more respected and believed than a doctor because mm. we didn't even have a clinic, mm. you know. So my initial inclination to become a doctor was motivated by wanting to help somebody that was close to me, a friend's mother that needed medical care. Listening to your story, it, 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 it appears to me um, you, you didn't exactly grow up in the kind of environment your children are growing up in now. I mean, you are an accomplished um, medical practitioner. You 
I'm not sure whether you can tell me if you're rich, but you have the ability to provide a certain luxury for your children's upbringing. Is that how you grew up? No, far from it. Mm. As, a, as a matter of fact, my father died when my mother was seven months pregnant. You never got to I know I never your got to know my father. Mm. And so it was an uncle of mine, Masu, who took care of me in school. Uh, having been put in school by my older brother, same father, who left at that time uh, for studies abroad. And so I wouldn't say that I grew up in a luxury environment like my kids have done. Mm. Uh, I haven't allowed them to, 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 to grow up in luxury as such, yeah. but it is obvious that um, they had more than I did. Mm. And uh, as you said, um, I don't consider myself a rich person, but I am able to provide the, the necessities of life. So and I'm very comfortable. Of, what kind of a man are you? I mean, we're trying to get to know um, Edward Mahama, yeah. the political figure we are mm. used to seeing on yeah. TV and hearing yeah. on radio. But yeah. then we're exploring your life yeah. as yeah. a medical doctor, which I believe is what makes you more fulfilled yeah. in, in several areas. What kind of a man are you? Indeed, that is the word, more fulfilled. Uh, I, because of the profession that I'm in, being a doctor, and the specialty in which I am, of obstetrics and gynecology, you know when women marry and they can't get children, they go to a gynecologist. When women get pregnant and they are afraid or they have problems with the pregnancy, they go to an obstetrician. I'm a gynecologist obstetrician. So, I get fulfillment in that uh, work, and indeed, when a woman has been trying for seven, eight, nine years and can't get a child and comes to me, and through the grace of God, I'm able to help her get a child, it is very, very fulfilling whether I'm paid or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you say what kind of a man I am, I will tell you that basically I am a Christian, a Bible practicing Christian, that is to say, I read my Bible regularly and I try to live by the Bible. And being a guy needed but, in... But, 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 but it, it's very difficult. To, it's it's very difficult. That. Of course, mm -hmm. of course, there are distractions. And um, being human, you have imperfections, you know. But I would say that uh, my life, my medical life, my political life, even my family life is guided by the fact that I'm a Baptist and I, mm -hmm. and I pride myself in trying to be a Christian who tries to follow what Christ said we should do. But, of course, no one can, 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 can meet that perfection. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm satisfied with uh, the effort that I make. And by God's grace, I think uh, I'm having a wonderful life. Are you a happy man? Very happy indeed. What makes you Married happy? Mm -hmm. with four kids. My kids, fortunately, growing up in America, have not you gone into... You call that fortunately. Why? I mean, no, I'm saying they fortunately have, they, they haven't... Have grown they have, up no, in Ghana. No, I'm not talking... It's not... Well, the environment there, you know, they haven't become drug pushers or drug users. People have grown up here and become drug pushers. Mm. And I'm saying fortunately because without me being there with them, they've still grown up to be kids that I'm very proud of. So I am happy because I'm, I'm happily married. I have four kids. I'm very proud of them. What else could you ask? Mm. You're a doctor. So, I mean, if... I, I want to come back to yes. you being a gynae, and I initially earlier started asking you whether you didn't feel uh, distraction in your work as, as, as a gynae. When you're a gynae, you see nudity yeah. a lot of women yeah. Uh, yeah. because people come to you helpless. Yeah. And um, how do you keep your sanity? I mean, if you're a man and you're yeah. a gynae, yeah. you must be seeing a lot of yeah. um, naked women. Yeah. How do you cope with Did you cope with that or how have you coped? The, 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 religion, the religion has helped me to cope with it. Mm. And um, you know, sometimes the iniquity in our hearts mm. I pray that it doesn't become transgression on my part. Uh, as you said, uh, in this field, if you don't take care, you'll get carried away because you're examining beautiful women, 
seen their nudity. Some more beautiful than your wife sometimes. Right? Well, I don't know that there's anybody be more beautiful than my wife <laughs> of all my pictures. So you don't see it that way. You see, it's good for us to establish it that way. So <laughs> That's that right. Can, uh, my yeah. wife is very beautiful, to be yeah, honest. You sure. know, and uh, I'm satisfied with her. Good. So good. Uh, uh, the temptation is uh, tempered by the fact that uh, she's a very understanding wife. Mm. I have no problems with her. Sometimes the men misbehave because their relationship with their wives leaves much to be desired. Mm. I have a very good relationship with my wife, and therefore, therefore, it's helped me. And also, as I said, I have never wanted for people to say, and he says he's a Christian. I have some friends who have stopped going to church because they said their pastors did things or their deacons did things, and I always tell them, I said, you know, my standard is not my pastor. My standard is Christ himself. Mm. And since he was God and I am human, I know I won't get there, but I don't consider what other men have done or are doing and say, therefore, I won't be a Christian mm. or therefore I will follow them. So my, my religion has helped me to be a better person, really. When we look at you and the fact that you went to medical school in Ghana yeah. and then you went to Columbus University, right? Well, Northwestern University. North Columbus Western. was the hospital, one okay. of the affiliates. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you, you went to medical school in Ghana, then you went to the U.S. That's to right. To specialize. Mm -hmm. And then you lived there. Yeah. What would, have, what would have made you decide to leave all those opportunities and privileges yeah. to return to your homeland, Ghana? Yes. Um, first, I went there with the intention that I'm going to specialize and come back mm -hmm. and probably teach or go back to the mission hospital where I was working. Mm -hmm. Secondly, while I was there, I remember very well that some of my colleague doctors there used to bring their mothers or sisters for me to take care of. And then my mother got sick here and didn't get the kind of proper care that I thought she should have gotten, and she died. Oh, dear. So I said to myself, well, you're sitting out there taking care of other people, and your own people are here dying. So in spite of the luxury of practicing in America, and I used to say that I'm comfortably stranded in America because I was very comfortable, very comfortable. We had a very nice home in a very posh area of north, northern side of Chicago, actually a predominantly Jewish area. I see. Yes. So we're very comfortable. But when I looked back and saw that my own people in Ghana were not getting the kind of medical care that I, I thought they should get, I decided that it was time to pack and come back home. So how and many so years came. did you practice, live and practice in the U.S.? I, it took me three and a half years to specialize after uh, graduating from here. And I practiced for another 11 and a half years. I was there a total of 15 years before coming back home. So and, and I had a very good you practice could have in America. become uh, an American citizen, are you? No, I'm not. Mm. Yes, I could have. I was a uh, legal, resident. A, that's a permanent resident, yeah. Mm. You didn't convert that into American citizenship? No, I didn't. Citizenship. I didn't convert it. Your children are? No, my children are by, by, by virtue of that, the, the, the fact that they were born, born there. there. Yeah. And how do you feel that you are Ghanaian? You have been contesting to be the president of the Republic of mm. Ghana on four occasions. Yes. And your children are Americans. Well, well you, you know, to you, be the president, uh, yeah. your children will be Americans no, well, and well, will have allegiance to another country. No, the, 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 the Constitution of Ghana allows for dual citizenship. The Constitution of America allows for dual citizenship. So uh, I'm sure that at some point or the other, they will, they will, they will, they, they are Ghanaian citizens, by better of the fact that both my wife and I are Ghanaians, you know. So if they have to declare or uh, relinquish one of the citizenships, I'm sure they will relinquish the American. They were here for Christmas. Mm. Yeah. They love you. What kind of relationship do you have with your children? Um, I have a very good relationship. My daughter in particular, I adore her because she, she is she is very close to me, and uh, incidentally, or not incidentally, um, she has taken to a lot of things that I, I do. You know, she thinks very much like me. She's a lawyer, by by the way, by profession, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm very close to the, uh, my my kids. Of course, they are closer to their mother than me mm -hmm. because I came back from the U.S. with them, even though they were born there, and they went to school here. 
until they grew up enough to go back to the United States for college. So the last two kids are in college now, one in Michigan State, the other one in uh, Washington uh, uh, State, you know, Pullman, you know, at, uh, in the western not part DC, of the United not States. Washington, no, not D.C. Washington no. State. Washington State, yeah. So, so I have a good relationship with them, and uh, I'm very happy that as a family we, we, are, we are close knit, yes. So uh, tell me about marriage. Um, I know that for you to be a medical doctor and to keep the level head to be as successful as you are you must have some um, degree of stability in, the, in your family yeah. tell us about marriage and how in all of this where you started from mm -hmm. in terms of marriage and where you think you are now when it comes to marriage and, mm -hmm. and the family yeah well you know i i, I Shortly after I graduated as a, a medical officer in Kolebu, mm. I got married to uh, the daughter of one of my teachers. Mm. And she, like her father, went, was a teacher, trained, said a trained mm. teacher. And then um, when we were going to the U.S., I suggested to her, I said, you know, if we are in the same field, it will be easier for us to understand one another. So she bought into it, and then she decided to study pharmacy. I see. So by virtue of her being a pharmacist, she has an inner understanding of what doctor's life is like. And so it has helped us to work together uh, in many ways. Uh, and so it has brought about the stability. If she was in another profession and didn't have an idea of what the doctor's life is like, perhaps would have had difficulties. But because she's also a pharmacist, knows what doctors go through, and knows what the doctor's life is like. It has uh, made for the stability in the family. And uh, also, our kids have been very good. When you have good children, they put the marriage together. If you have children that are troublesome, they can divide the marriage, because the father or the mother may be identifying more with the troublesome child and it can bring this, this unity in the family. But, um, but fortunately for us, all our four kids have been very good, and so it has brought us together. Right, you're watching PM Express Personality Profile, and my guest is Dr. Edward Nasigiri Mahama, who yeah. was born in 1945 in Nalerigu in the northern region of Ghana. We'll take a short break and when we return, uh, Dr. Mahama is not only uh, an astute politician and a medical doctor, but is an author as well. we'll, we'll walk, he walk us through his book, The New Ghanaian, A Mandate for Change, and then we'll delve deeper into this man in, in a way that you, you've, you've never imagined. Stay with us. to PM Express personality profile. Tonight my guest is a medical doctor born in the northern part of the country, graduated from medical school as far back as 1972. But what many of you know him for possibly uh, might be the fact that he has been very consistent in our political landscape. He, stuck, he stood for president in 1976. He stood for president again in 2000, 2004, and 2008 on the ticket of the People's National Convention, PNC. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about by now. My guest on PM Express personality profile is Dr. Edward Mahawa. It's great to be in your home, sir. The pleasure is mine, and thank you for coming. We haven't heard from you a lot uh, during the 2008 elections, uh, up to up to, sorry, 2012 elections, up to up to today. When February, what went wrong? I mean, did you just decide to focus on your practice as a doctor? Yes, uh, nothing went wrong. But uh, the People's National Convention decided to try uh, with another gentleman for the candidature, mm. and. Um, I made a deliberate in, uh, effort to, to let him be known to the Ghanaian public 
and uh, not confuse them. So basically, I took myself out of politics just so that he could go. And um, that's why you haven't heard from me politically. That's but fine. I'm still doing my work as a doctor. Great. So, I mean, many people do not know you uh, intimately as a medical doctor. But you've been around since 1972. Uh, tell us what first shaped your decision to be a medical doctor and then uh, what made you juggle that with yeah. active politics? Yes. Um, well, you know, I grew up in Alergo and when I was growing up in Alergo, there was not even a hospital there. But during the period that I entered primary school, the American Baptist Mission decided to open a medical hospital there. And the doctor who came, the American doctor, actually started his clinic under a tree in a mobile van. During that time, um, I met him at the lorry park of the village, trying to communicate with one of my countrymen. He didn't speak Mampule, the guy didn't speak English, so I interpreted for him. He was so impressed, he invited me to come. He was living in Tamale and driving 105 miles to Nalergo to, to provide medical care. So he invited me to come and help him interpret. And that is how come I got to know of orthodox medicine. Because up until that time, there was no hospital, no clinic. So we we're using herbs and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. But once I got to uh, know him, I thought that the job he did was cool. But I was motivated to become a doctor because at that same time, a schoolmate of mine, in fact, the classmate of mine, had his mother develop what we call the psycho-vaginal fistula. Women who go into labor and the labor becomes obstructed, they labor for many hours, they end up destroying the base of their urinary bladder. So they can't control the urine. The, the, everywhere they go, the urine is dripping as it is formed by the kidneys. And she became an outcast in her own house. Nobody wanted to associate with this woman. And I felt at that time that why is it that doctors can't help this woman? So I decided that I'll be a doctor that will help people who are in labor. Mm -hmm. And that is how I became a gynecologist. I see. So, so the motivation to become a doctor was not um, necessarily because you, you saw an avenue to become a rich man when you grow. Indeed. That was not At the, the time, I didn't even know what doctors made, what, what, what kind of income they made. Mm. And uh, at the time I was growing, if you were a teacher, you were more respected and believed than a doctor because we didn't even have a clinic. Mm. You know, so my initial inclination to become a doctor was motivated by wanting to help somebody that was close to me, a friend's mother that needed medical care. Listening to your story, it, 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 it appears to me um, you, you didn't exactly grow up in the kind of environment your children are growing up in now. I mean, you are an accomplished um, medical practitioner. You, I'm not sure whether you can tell me if you're rich, but you have the ability to provide a certain luxury for your children's upbringing. Is that how you grew up? No, far from it. Mm. As, a, as a matter of fact, my father died when my mother was seven months pregnant. You never got to I know I never your got to know my father. Mm. And so it was an uncle of mine, Masu, who took care of me in school. Uh, having been put in school by my older brother, same father, who left at that time uh, for studies abroad. And so I wouldn't say that I grew up in a luxury environment like my kids have done. Mm. Uh, I haven't allowed them to, 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 to grow up in luxury as such, yeah. but it is obvious that um, they had more than I did. Mm. And uh, as you said, um, I don't consider myself a rich person, but I am able to provide the, the necessities of life. So and I'm very comfortable. Of, what kind of a man are you? I mean, we're trying to get to know um, Edward Mahama, yeah. the political figure we are used to seeing on yeah. TV and hearing yeah. on radio. But yeah. then we're exploring your life yeah. as yeah. a medical doctor, which I believe is what makes you more fulfilled yeah. in, in several areas. What kind of a man are you? Indeed, that is the word, more fulfilled. Uh, I, because 
of the profession that I'm in, being a doctor, and the specialty in which I am, obstetrics and gynecology, you know when women marry and they can't get children, they go to a gynecologist. When women get pregnant and they are afraid or they have problems with the pregnancy, they go to an obstetrician. I'm a gynecologist obstetrician. So I get fulfillment in that uh, work. And indeed, when a woman has been trying for seven, eight, nine years and can't get a child and comes to me, and through the grace of God, I'm able to help her get a child, it is very, very fulfilling whether I'm paid or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you say what kind of a man I am, I will tell you that basically I am a Christian, a Bible practicing Christian. That is to say, I read my Bible regularly and I try to live by the Bible. And being a guy needed but, in... But, 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 but it, it's very difficult. To, it's it's very difficult. That. Of course, mm. of course, there are distractions. And um, being human, you have imperfections, you know. But I would say that uh, my life, my medical life, my political life, even my family life is gathered by the fact that I'm a Baptist and I, mm. and I pride myself in trying to be a Christian who tries to follow what Christ said we should do. But, of course, no one can, 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 can meet that perfection. Mm. So, but I'm satisfied with uh, the effort that I make. And by God's grace, I think uh, I'm having a wonderful life. Are you a happy man? Very happy indeed. What makes you Married happy? Married with four kids. My kids, fortunately, growing up in America, have not you gone into... that fortunately. Why? I mean, no, I'm saying they fortunately have, they, they haven't... Have they have, no, no, I'm not talking... It's not... Well, the environment there, mm. you know, they haven't become drug pushers or drug users. People have grown up here and become drug pushers. Mm. And I'm saying fortunately because without me being there with them, they've still grown up to be kids that I'm very proud of. So I am happy because... I'm, I'm happily married. I have four kids. I'm very proud of them. What else could you ask? You're a doctor. So, I mean, if I, I want to come back to yes. you being a gynae, and I initially earlier started asking you whether you didn't feel uh, distraction in your work as, as, as a gynae. When you're a gynae, you see nudity a yeah. lot of women yeah. Uh, yeah. because people come to you helpless. Yeah. And um, how do you keep your sanity? I mean, if you're a man and you're yeah. a gynae, yeah. you must be seeing a lot of yeah. um, naked women. Yeah. How do you cope with? Did you cope with that, or how have you coped? The, the, the religion, the religion has helped me to cope with it. Mm. And um, you know, sometimes the iniquity in our hearts. Mm. I pray that it doesn't become transgression on my part. Mm. Uh, as you said, uh, in this field, if you don't take care, you'll get carried away because you're examining beautiful women, seeing their nudity. Some more beautiful than your wife sometimes. Right? Well, I don't know that there's anybody be more beautiful than my wife <laughs> of all my patients. So you don't see it that <laughs> way. Is it? It's good for us to establish it that way. <laughs> That's so that right. Can, I, I, yeah. My wife is very beautiful, to be yeah, honest, you sure. know, and uh, I'm satisfied with her. Good. So good. Uh, uh, the temptation is uh, tempered by the fact that uh, she's a very understanding wife. I have no problems with her. Sometimes the men misbehave because their relationship with their wives leaves much to be desired. Mm. I have a very good relationship with my wife, and therefore, therefore, it's helped me. And also, as I said, I have never wanted for people to say, and he says he's a Christian. I have some friends who have stopped going to church because they said their pastors did things or their deacons did things, and I always tell them, I said, you know, my standard is not my pastor. My standard is Christ himself. Mm. And since he was God and I am human, I know I won't get there, but I don't consider what other men have done or are doing and say, therefore, I won't be a Christian mm -hmm. or therefore I will follow them. So my, my religion has helped me to be a better person, really. When we look at you and the fact that you went to medical school in Ghana yeah. and then you went to Columbus University, right? Well... Northwestern University. North Columbus Western. was the hospital, one okay. of the affiliates. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you, you went to medical school in Ghana, then you went to the U.S. That's to right. To specialize. specialize. Mm -hmm. And then you lived there. Yeah. What would, have, what would have made you decide 
to leave all those opportunities and privileges yeah. to return to your homeland, Ghana? Yes. Um, first, I went there with the intention that I'm going to specialize and come back mm -hmm. and probably teach or go back to the mission hospital where I was working. Mm -hmm. Secondly, while I was there, I remember very well that some of my colleague doctors there used to bring their mothers or sisters for me to take care of. And then my mother got sick here and didn't get the kind of proper care that I thought she should have gotten, and she died. Oh, dear. So I said to myself, well, you're sitting out there taking care of other people, and your own people are here dying. So in spite of the luxury of practicing in America, and I used to say that I'm comfortably stranded in America because I was very comfortable, mm. very comfortable. We had a very nice home in a very posh area of North, northern side of Chicago, actually a predominantly Jewish area. I see. Yes. So we're very comfortable. But when I looked back and saw that my own people in Ghana were not getting the kind of medical care that I, I thought they should get, I decided that it was time to pack and come back home. So and how so many I years came. did you practice, live and practice in the U.S.? I, it took me three and a half years to specialize after uh, graduating from here. And I practiced for another 11 and a half years. I was there a total of 15 years before coming back home. So and, and I had a very good practice you could have in America. You become uh, an American citizen, are you? No, I'm not. Mm. Yes, I could have. I was a uh, legal, a, that's a permanent resident, yeah. You didn't convert that into American citizenship? No, I didn't. Citizenship. I didn't convert it. Your children are? No, my children are by, by virtue of that, the, the, the fact, fact that they were born, born there. there. Yeah. And how do you feel that you are Ghanaian? You have been contesting to be the president of the Republic of mm -hmm. Ghana on four occasions. Yes. And your children are Americans. Well, were you, you know, to you, be the president, yeah. your children will be Americans no, well, and well, will have allegiance to another country. No, the, 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 the constitution of Ghana allows for dual citizenship. The Constitution of America allows for dual citizenship. So uh, I'm sure that at some point or the other, they will, they will, they will, they, they are Ghanaian citizens, by better of the fact that both my wife and I are Ghanaians, you know. So if they have to declare or uh, relinquish one of the citizenships, I'm sure they will relinquish the American. They were here for Christmas, mm. yeah. They love you. What kind of relationship do you have with your children? Um, I have a very good relationship. My daughter, in particular, I adore her because she, she is, she is very close to me. And uh, incidentally, or not incidentally, um, she has taken to a lot of things that I, I do. You know, she thinks very much like me. She's a lawyer, by by the way, by profession, mm -hmm. and. Um, so I'm very close to the, uh, my, my kids. Of course, they are closer to their mother than me because mm -hmm. I came back from the U.S. with them, even though they were born there. And they went to school here until they grew up enough to go back to the United States for college. So the last two kids are in college now, one in Michigan State, the other one in uh, Washington uh, uh, State, you know, Pullman. You know, at uh, in the western not part DC, of the United States, no, no, not DC, DC Washington no. State, Washington State, yeah. So, so I have a good relationship with them, and uh, I'm very happy that as a family we, we are we are close knit. Yes. So, uh, tell me about marriage. Um, I know that for you to be a medical doctor and to keep the level head, to be as successful as you are, you must have some. Um, degree of stability in, the, in your family. Yeah. Tell us about marriage and how in all of this where you started from mm. in terms of marriage and where you think you are now when it comes to marriage and, mm. and the family. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 shortly after I graduated as a, a medical officer in Kolobu, mm. I got married to uh, the daughter of one of my teachers. Mm. And she, like her father, went, was a teacher, trained, said a trained teacher. And then um, when we were going to the U.S., I suggested to her, I said, you know, if we are in the same field, it will be easier for us to understand one another. So she bought into it, and then she decided to study pharmacy. I see. So by virtue of her being a pharmacist, she has an inner understanding of what doctor's life is like. And so... It has helped us 
to work together uh, in many ways. Uh, and so it has brought about the stability. If she was in another profession and didn't have an idea of what the doctor's life is like, perhaps would have had difficulties. But because she's also a pharmacist, knows what doctors go through, and knows what the doctor's life is like, it has uh, made for the stability in the family. And uh, also, our kids have been very good. And when you have good children, they put the marriage together. If you have children that are troublesome, they can divide the marriage because the father or the mother may be identifying more with the troublesome child and it can bring this, this unity in the family. But, um, but fortunately for us, all our four kids have been very good and so it has brought us together. Right, you're watching PM Express Personality Profile and my guest is Dr. Edward Nasigiri Mahama who yeah. was born in 1945 in Nalerigu in the northern region of Ghana. We'll take a short break and when we we'll return, uh, Dr. Mahama is not only uh, an astute politician and a medical doctor, but is an author as well. we'll, we'll walk, he walk us through his book, The New Ghanaian, A Mandate for Change. And then we'll delve deeper into this man in, in a way that you, you've, you've never imagined. Stay with us. Welcome back to PM Express Personality Friday with Dr. Edward Mahama. And before we went on the break, I spoke to you about uh, Dr. Mahama's book titled The New Ghanaian A Mandate for Change. So, Doc, tell us what inspired you to write a book of this nature. Um, it was the condition of the country when I came back from the U.S. in 1990 mm. that inspired me to write this book. For example, when I was leaving for the United States in 1970. Five, they had started a building in my hometown, Nalerigo. They had also started, uh, at that time, there was also pipe borne water flowing in the town. When I came back from America 15 years later, the building that they had started was still standing there uncompleted, government building. There was no more running water in the town. In fact, I mentioned that in, mm. in the book. You know, and I thought to myself, you know, having come back from the U.S. and knowing what the condition was there, and also seeing that this nation is a very, very rich nation by all standards, mm -hmm. I said, no, this is not the right thing. In fact, that's what drew me into politics in the first place. And so this is a political book, but we're not going here to talk politics. So yeah. let's go back to the medical aspect. Right, uh, that's yes. fine. And in chapter two, you said that, I'm not a politician. Yes. That's 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 non-political. Yes. So let's okay. talk about right. chapter that's two. True, that's true. So that's when you you wrote in your yeah. book yeah. that I'm me, I'm not a politician. Yeah. What exactly did you mean? Well, I you know in in Africa politics, people go into politics to make money. They go into politics to have power, and they go into politics to reward themselves in various ways. Now we have seen it in this country. Now, I have always considered the political power, the president, for example, the presidency, as my stethoscope, which I wear to make a diagnosis and give treatment. Mm -hmm. The political authority of a president is to solve social, economic problems for the people. Mm -hmm. So I've never seen myself looking for that position as a way to play politics with people's lives, as a way to, to have authority over them. The one authority that is final is God's authority over man. But man's authority over another man is temporary. So I have always felt that I ran for president because I could see that with that authority, there were so many things one could do. And therefore, if I got that authority, those are the things that I would have done with it. And so I, I didn't consider myself a politician. And that's why after I went to Congress and they voted somebody else, I haven't missed the politics. 
I'm, I'm busy with my practice and I'm very, very satisfied. Mm -hmm. Whatever I do, I do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is satisfaction in that. But you failed four times yes. in your bid to lead the yes. country. Yes. You must be a politician to be that consistent. Well, yes. I think uh, I'm consistent at whatever I try to do. And it was driven by the belief that the presidency of Ghana can make a change for the people of Ghana. That I have never accepted. That's why in the book I, I mentioned that Ghana was suffering from economic diabetes. Extreme poverty in the midst of abundant natural and human resource. That still worries you, right? That still plagues your that, heart. That, 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 that was the motivation there. That the, the potential of the country and the actual standard of the country were not commensurate. There was no match. Mm -hmm. You know, the potential way, way up there and the way, way down here. And, and so that, that is what drove me into So having politics. failed, I mean, all this number of times yeah. to lead the country, yeah. do you feel that you have not had the opportunity to serve your country in the way you would have? No, because even though I have not gotten the position, some of the ideas I was championing have been put in place. For example? National Health Insurance. If you go back and look at the presidential debates of 19, 2000, 2000, November 2000. Out of the seven candidates, I was the one who was speaking about national health insurance. Today, it is in place and serving the people of Ghana. If it you, has if been you, politicized if, so much. When well, the NBC well, 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 say we've made it better, yeah, MPP yeah, says it, we've made it better. Well, well, MPP what, says no, no. it's collapsing. NDC yes. says no, it's not. It's yes, doing better. Yes, yes. The politicians can play politics with it, but I do know that it is providing care for Ghanaians, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and uh, if you talk about uh, even the ministry that is now changing to gender and social protection, first instituted as Minister of Women Affairs, was an issue that I debated Dr. Urukubrobe and others at a FIDAP forum back in 2000, saying that this sector of our community, women and children, are marginalized. And we need to bring them upstream on board. The, the, the platform. And so when that ministry was created, even Dr. Uruku Brobe said, Dr. Muhammad, this is your program. I said, so long as you know that, I'm happy. And so long as it will do even more good for Ghanaian women, that is even better for me. So as, uh, as many times I have run, something has come out of each of those attempts that I have But made. you never had, you barely had 1% in all those times. And Muhammad, uh, Hassan Ayariga didn't do any better anyway. I mean, do you think PNC is dying? No. PNC won't die. I mean, uh, uh, it's a party that is established and um, will not die. People but, also but accuse let me, you let me, of yes. not being yeah. Yeah. proactive mm -hmm. in the in Krumai's unity with CPP, for example, that you were standing on the curb and made it impossible for the two Nkrumai splinter groups to come together. As Only a, people as a who don't know. Entity. Only people who don't know. If you talk to Dr. Dele, who was chairman of NCPP uh, when I was still a candidate, he will tell you. And if you talk to even uh, the current chairman, mm. uh, Honorable Samia Nkrumah, she will tell you. I had told her that if I came back from that Congress, the two parties will unite if I was the leader and the candidate. And uh, I had given her that assurance. And, and therefore, over the years, over the years, Talk to Dr. Professor Nino Dauna. He's now no more pol political, but he was the general secretary of the CPP. Talk to all of them. They will tell you that for the Nkrumah's unity, I was number one proponent for the Nkrumah's to unite. I see you're passionate about it all, but you would still want us to uh, delve into your medical career. Let me switch to something many people uh, may be very observant with in terms of your dressing. You're always noted with your typical <laughs> bow tie. Has it become your fashion statement, especially the kente bow ties? Well, I don't know about fashion, but when I got back to the country, uh, in America where I was practicing, I was practicing in an area of the Chicago called the Gold Coast. Mm. You have to go to work as a gynecologist in three-piece suits. But when I came back here, I said, no, I can't come and be wearing a suit to uh, look at how the, the heat. Yeah. So I'll wear a simple shirt. 
And to be honest, I was influenced by a senator in Chicago called Senator Paul Simon. Mm -hmm. He was one of the moderators at the first ever presidential debate in Accra here in November 2000. I see. He used to wear a kente bow tie, a bow tie. So I decided that I will wear kente to signify my Ghanaian-ness. Yeah. So when he came here for that uh, uh, debate sponsored by CNN, I actually gave him a box full of kente bow ties. How said, many oh, do you have? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> How many? My wife buys some. Take a guess. You know, no, no, I can't. I can't get. You I have like get. hundred pieces. I, I, I can wear one. Colors? I can wear different one every day for a whole year, uh, and I'll still not be. Through. And you, you feel good about it? Oh yes. Do you because, dress like this to see your patients? No, ordinarily, yes. Um, um, I've become more casual because uh, Ghana things are very casual. Mm. But uh, when I came back and wanted to maintain the standards that I was used to in America. I used to wear a bow tie every day, but now sometimes I wear just uh, what you may call a, 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 yes, it's a simple t-shirt, you know, or, or, or so, or, or uh, ordinary shirt and, and go to work because, uh, as I said, um, the environment here allows you to, to, to be that uh, casual, you know. What about your hat? Uh, for most of the time I have known you, I'm a young man, and um, the time I've known you in, in, in the political space, you mm. always wear your hat, and then, you know, when you, you have to dress with your bow tie, sometimes you can wear the hat as well. I mean, is there anything special about the hat? No, I mean, uh, as a Nordner, we, 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 we don't consider that a man is dressed properly if you wear the smock and you don't put on the hat. And I always, for my politics, wore the smock because I was running for a position in Ghana. And so I wanted to emphasize that uh, as my old uh, 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 friend and the late uh, 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 Dan Latte used to say, mm -hmm. you know, eat what you grow and grow what you to eat. eat yeah. So I thought if I'm going to run for politics in Ghana, I must wear a Ghanaian attire. And coming from the north, the attire is the smoke, of course. Mm. And as I said, you're not properly dressed, so far as a non is concerned. If you wear the smoke and you don't wear a hat, so that is how come I, I used I to see. wear the so smoke and the hat. There's nothing fetish or no. an obsession no, about no, exactly no, no. how you look. No, it's proper you, dressing mm. uh, according to our, our traditional standards. It's proper dressing to put on a hat when you wear a smoke. Yes. Your wife also comes from the north in yes, part of Ghana. Yes, yes. Where exactly to, does she come? Bungpurugu, near Bungpurugu. the border. Nyo -nyo. Oh, that's the Bungpurugu Nyo -nyo. That's right. <laughs> Bungpurugu Nyo -nyo. Yeah. Right. So I mean, I mean, switching back from your dressing and mm. how you represented yourself to your patients. Let's talk about when you returned to Ghana from the U.S. to yeah. set up this place, yeah. uh, your home and your hospital. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the experiences and the decisions that went into setting up your, your own clinic and how it has been so yeah. far. Well, as I said at the beginning, when I got to the U.S., I always knew I would come home. And I never allowed my wife to forget that we are going home. Mm. So at about the time in 1989, 1990, my professor and head of department in, in Chicago, where I was teaching in Northwestern, called Professor John Shara. He was uh, appointed by Carnegie Foundation to work with uh, Thomas Elkins to establish a postgraduate or specialist training program in Kolebo here. I see. So after his first visit, he came back and said, Ed, you're always talking about going. I have to go and t train your, your fellow Ghanaians to become specialists like you. So come on, let's go. Let's go. So that's how come I came almost unprepared. I had bought the land here in Oko and was preparing to come and build a hospital and come back home. But when he said, let's go, I jumped on in, the, in the plane and we came home. And so when we came, I had to take this place, which was uncompleted, mm -hmm. the clinic. You had started working on yeah, it yes, whilst I, you I, were in the States. That, that, no, no, well, yes, I started working on coming home while I was in the States. No, I mean the building, the construction No, the building, the it was the developers who were building okay. the site, okay. Paraguay Estates. Okay. And okay. so I just came and found that there was a building up uh, 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 at, that stage. at that stage, and I and I bought it. 
And I came back actually at that time to teach at the, at the medical school to help teach the postgraduate training, uh, uh, to, the, the postgraduate uh, course. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very proud of my association with the Kolbu because some of the, in fact, the current head of ONG is one of the people that I helped to train uh, to become a specialist. I see. Yes. I see. So that's how you came home. Yes. So let's, t let's t talk us through your, the challenges, initial challenges. You, may, you, you, you speak about just seeing the, the, the construction at a stage and you bought it. Yes. It sounds so easy. It's, it's not that easy. I mean, it's not that easy. Tell us how you source yes. funding yeah. and yeah. then the challenges yeah. you had in getting a license mm. to turn this place into a hospital, mm. etc. Did you have permit to turn this place into a hospital? In fact, I, I had to apply to the uh, uh, dent, med, dental, uh, midwives and dental council, which licenses uh, uh, clinics. And they had to come and inspect it. And uh, this was back in 1989, mm. you know, uh, to get me. So actually, it's licensed, yes, appropriately. And by virtue of the fact that I was a teacher at Kolobo, it was easier because they knew that I was a bona fide, you know, registered by the Ghana Medical and Dental Council as a practitioner. And I think those are the things you need to open a clinic. You, you must be a practitioner registered by the Ghana Medical and Dental Council. And so I had those qualifications. And uh, yes, the financing was a little bit problematic. And I must say that there were a lot of frustrations. For example, that hospital that I mentioned, I, I actually secured a loan from one of the institutions in Ghana, signed for, but the money was never disbursed mm. because of the political situation in the country. At the same time, I actually had negotiated a loan from an institution in America. Again, uh, the people who have helped me include somebody like Professor Kofi Kumodo. Uh, when we came back, he accepted to act as the secretary to the foundation that owns this uh, uh, hospital. It's not Dr. Muhammad's clinic. People in Ghana think because I'm the key doctor there, yeah, it's my property. It's owned by a foundation. And Professor Kumado is the one who actually helped us establish the foundation and he's the secretary. And as I said, he did a very good job negotiating the Americans for that loan for the money and uh, got a very good deal. But again, uh, money was not disbursed because it was contingent on the money here being disbursed to build the building so that the money there would be used to, to, set, up to, to set up, to bring the equipment. And uh, at that time, even, uh, radiation was not in the country. I had negotiated for radiation equipment to put in that building. But all these things, because of the obstacles and challenges in this country of establishing things, uh, they've never come to, to, to fruition. But I'm still working on that. Well, Dr. Edwin Mahama is my guest on PM Express personality profile. We'll still talk about the challenges of establishing things in Ghana, and then we'll take a cue from him when we return. Stay with us.